Uh, Genesis 34, page 29. Dinah, Leah's daughter, whom she bore to Jacob, went out to see some of the young women of the area. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, a prince of the region, saw her, he took her and raped her. He became infatuated with Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young girl and spoke tenderly to her. Get me this girl as a wife, he told his father, Hamor. Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah. But since his sons were with his cattle in the field, he remained silent until they returned. Meanwhile, Shechem's father Hamor came to speak with Jacob. Jacob's sons returned from the field when they heard about the incident and were deeply grieved and angry. For Shechem had committed an outrage against Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, and such a thing should not be done. Hamor said to Jacob's sons, My son Shechem is strongly attracted to your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. In a marry with us, give your daughters to us, take our daughters for yourselves. Live with us, the land is before you. Settle here, move about and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, Grant me this favour and I'll give you whatever you say. Set for me the compensation and the gift. I'll give you whatever you ask me. Just give the girl to be my wife. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. We, we cannot do this thing, they said to him. Give our sister to an un, giving our sister to an uncircumcised man is a disgrace to us. We will agree with you only on this condition. If all your males are circumcised as we are, then we will give you our daughters, take your daughters for ourselves, live with you and become one people. But if you'll not listen to us and be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and go. Their words seemed good in the eyes of Hamor and his son Shechem. The young man did not delay doing this because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most important in all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city and spoke to the men there. These men are peaceful toward us, they said. Let them live in our land and move about in it, for indeed the region is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as our wives and give our daughters to them. But the men will agree to live with us and be one people only on this condition. If all our men are circumcised as they are, won't their herds, their possessions and all their livestock become ours? Only let us agree with them and they will live with us. All the able-bodied men listened to Hamor and his son Shechem and all the able-bodied men were circumcised. On the third day, when they were still in pain, Two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords, went into the unsuspecting city and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with their swords, took Dinah from Shechem's house and went away. Jacob's other sons came to the slaughter and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, cattle, donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field. They captured all their possessions, children and wives and plundered everything in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you've brought trouble on me, making me odious to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. We're few in number. If they unite against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they answered, should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you open your newsletters, there's an outline there, some questions up on the top right. Uh, If you've missed any of the sermons in the series or you want to go back and re-listen to one, uh, they're on our website. Uh, Let me begin with a very simple question. Uh, What do you make of Genesis 34? One part of me wants to take a shower. Another part of me is horrified. And as a preacher, I want to skip over such a passage, a passage that covers sexual violence, deception, the silence of those entrusted with care, the abuse of symbols given for good, materialism, wanton violence, and the reality of disobedience played out in tragedy. A third part of me holds desperately to the truth that this is still God's word. It's the revelation of God himself through his words so that we might know him and his good plans. So let me go back to the question, what are we 
What are we going to make of Genesis 34? Might be wise for me to pray. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, It is your word. Uh, It's a real word given by a real God who deals with a real world that is really broken. Father, thank you that you sent your son into this world as the word in the flesh so we could meet you, the speaker of these words, face to face. Thank you that in this is the revelation of our sin, the exposure of our need, and the gracious gift of our salvation. Father, as we deal with these really horrific events, please help me to be faithful. Please help us to listen to you. And please transform us as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we know where we are in Genesis. This is the fourth year. We're doing Genesis over eight years, a chunk each year. Uh, We know where we are in the commitment of God to reverse the curse of sin on the world. Uh, the promise he made to Abraham's family that through that one family, God would deal with the brokenness of the world, reverse the curse of sin. As we've spent time with Jacob, a number of people have said they've found this account really encouraging because he's just like us. He struggles, his family is dysfunctional, he battles. As he left his family, fleeing the threat of his brother Esau, Remember, God committed to him in a promise, didn't he? That's our memory verse, Genesis 28, 15. I'm with you. I'll go with you wherever you are. I will keep you. I will not abandon you until everything I've promised to you takes place. 14 years of labour with his uncle, the deceptive lab. Two marriages that were part of that labour, 11 sons, one daughter that eventuated. Six years of sheep husbandry and stock work the wealth that God granted him through that, the return to the land of Abraham, wrestling with the Lord overnight, being renamed Israel in rebirth, reconciliation in impossible grace with his brother who wanted to kill him. Through all of that, we've seen Jacob experience that promise, haven't we? Time and time again. And so as he settles in Shechem, can you bring up the map, please? As he settles in Shechem and sets up home, as he purchases land from the locals, we're doing a fist pump because we think that Israel is here at his peak. But now we'll start to see Jacob peeking through again, won't we? If you remember how we finished last week, uh, if you remember what happened, I'm going to try and do this with technology. Jacob settled here in Shechem. He should have gone here to Bethel. It's almost Bethel. But there's no such thing as almost obedience, is there? (laughs) It's disobedience. He only had to go another 20 miles and he would have done what God commanded him. The disobedience of Jacob leads to the events of Genesis 34. We're meant to make that link and at least make the connection between obedience and disobedience and walking faithfully in the face of grace. So whatever else we get out of a chapter like this, we are reading our family history as God's people and we're opening closets we'd rather keep shut. We're seeing the warning of what happens when we meet impossible grace with disobedience. As we do with the passage, I'm going to give a brief outline. Uh, Then we're going to look at a number of observations. You'll see them there on your page. And then I'm going to try and draw it together in three ways we can apply what we've heard. Uh, Jacob's mob have settled in Shechem. I'm at point one on the outline. Dinah, his daughter by Leah, his only daughter, goes for a walk one day. The son of a local lord sees her, seizes her, abuses her, and then, as we'll find out, detains her. In a strange way, he becomes besotted with her and he demands from his father that this woman become his wife. The account of the violence reaches Jacob. He says nothing. Negotiations begin. Dinah's brothers come back from work. Look there in verse 7 to see their reaction. They were deeply grieved and angry. (laughs) 
For Shechem had committed an outrage against Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, and such a thing should not be done. Hamor Hamor is there with his son Shechem. And do you notice in verse 8, they negotiate with Jacob's sons, with the brothers. They offer inner marriage, settlement, and land. Shechem starts in, and I think he recognises what he's done because he says, name the compensation, whatever you want, so that we can get married. Jacob's boys answer. Do you notice how they answer? Did you see that word? It's a key word, isn't it, in the story of Jacob? They answer deceitfully. They demand that all the men of Hamor's mob get circumcised. Then compensation will have been paid. The marriage can proceed. It seems like a good deal to Shechem. Hamor and Shechem return to their mob. They put the case positively. They reveal the economic benefit, the opportunity for growth in wealth and strength. Everyone agrees and all the men are circumcised. On the third day, Dinah's brothers, Simeon and Levi, take their swords. They kill every male in Shechem's mob. They rescue Dinah. They leave. The other brothers turn up as a mopping up team. They join in the bloodshed. They pillage the city. They take everything, women, children, stock and possessions. The account finishes with the only word from Jacob, a self-interested rebuke and a cry of outrage from Simeon and Levi. That's a thankfully brief sketch of the events. Uh, Let me encourage you to talk about these events together. And not in a flippant way. Please don't joke. Talk seriously about these events with each other in the context of God's very clear word. I want to help you in that by making some observations. And you'll see them there on your outline. The first observation I want to make, and it's an obvious one, but it still needs to be made, is that this is God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 reminds us that God's word is the breathing out of his nature, his character. We know God's nature. We heard it there in Psalm 56. Can you, isn't it such a lovely image in Psalm 56? God put my tears in a bottle. Isn't that a great phrase? That God might bottle our tears. He's generous and kind and gracious and holy and merciful and just. He is jealous of his mom. He knows the plight of the poor and the downtrodden and he lifts them up. He brings down the rich and the powerful. As we saw last week, God is inevitably gracious beyond our imagination. And this word is his word. And his word brings life. There is a great passage that I read at funeral services. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all all flesh is like grass, all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower drops off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached as good news to you. Whatever else we want to say about this, it's God's word. Somehow. We have a revelation of his nature. We have the offer of life. We have truths that will save us in these words. Here are tethers and guides and foundations to help us understand God's word. And if they're not helpful today, we need to store them away because they will be helpful any time we open God's word. It is the revelation of his nature. His nature is good and it brings salvation. Observation number two, we must not minimise the reality of sin and the horror of its effects. Please don't forget the immediate context of what's going on here. The context is the disobedience of Jacob. He should have gone to Bethel. 
He should have gone back to where God first met him as he left the land. He should have responded to God's impossible grace with obedience. He didn't. He chose partial obedience. Now, I am not saying, please hear me clearly, I'm not saying there's a causal link in these events. But I am saying that this has been put together so that we see the context for these events in the bigger picture of human disobedience, of the horror of sin. We're meant to see the horror of really bad sin. But we're also meant to see the horror of sin that we minimise. Sin as simple as, I don't like what you're saying, God, so I'm going to disobey it. We're meant to see that all sin is horrible. All sin. And the effect of sin is stain. It affects Dinah, doesn't it? It leaves Hamor and Shechem and all their male friends dead. It leaves their women and children bereft and dispossessed. It stays with Simeon and Levi right to the end of Genesis, doesn't it? So when Jacob blesses them, he says, you are bloodthirsty men and the blood will be in your generations. Please don't minimise sin. Please don't minimise any sin. Let's not excuse it. Let's not explain it away. Let's not be flippant. Let's not turn a blind eye. Let's not indulge it. Sin is horrific and it stains. All sin is like this. From the little lie we tell in order to persuade someone through to the avoidance of perhaps financial responsibility in things like taxes and wages, into the way we describe people and events to those around us when maybe they aren't there. The thoughts and desires that our keyboards could reveal if they could talk into the way we treat the good things of God. Do you notice that? Here, I'll give you a symbol to say you are my chosen people. Hey, fellas, why don't we take that symbol and use it and abuse it for our own personal advantage? Good things like church and fellowship and relationship and family and all sin is horrific and so is its stain. Observation three. Jacob's silence and his family is heart-rending. We see that particular sharpness of human sin in the state of Jacob's family. One of the If you haven't picked it up, let let me be bald. One one of the persistent themes in Genesis is how dysfunctional God's family is. And it's a mark of God's grace that he persists with them. In fact, not just a mark of God's grace, but an incredible reassurance of God's undeserved kindness. But here we see it particularly sharply, don't we? And it's signposted. We need to pick up the signpost. Did you see in verse 1 how Dinah is identified? It's the longest definition or identification of any of the children. Dinah is Leah's daughter whom she bore Jacob. (coughs) It stands next to the identification of Simeon and Levi in verse 25. Who are they? They're Jacob's sons. Let's unpack that. They're Dinah's brothers. There's family division, isn't there? Do you remember that from that 14 years of birth wars? <laughs> we'll see it again in the story of Joseph when all the children of Leah gang up on this one favoured son. Uh, it was a family division seen in the approach to Esau. Did you pick that up last week? The way the family was divided in terms of favouritism, the slave girls first and then Leah and then the favourites. It's seen here in these events, isn't it? And now we're given no real reason for Jacob's silence. And did you notice that he's silent until the second last verse? He speaks nothing, says nothing until the second last verse. But many people posit that perhaps his silence is because of his favouritism. Oh, it's only Leah's kids. That's why they're identified as Leah's kids, because she wasn't the favourite. And let me tell you, that is shameful, it's abhorrent, it's nasty, it's petty, it's heartrending. 
Now, the family of God's people is not perfect. They do struggle with sin. They disobey God. Uh, That's not an excuse. That's an observation. And what does God's impossible grace do? Uh, Just one foot in front of the other, chasing them, holding them, inexorable, inevitable. Even when Jacob sets up camp in almost Bethel, God's grace doesn't go away. Now, that is reassuring. It should be. But let me tell you, it should drive us to mourning and lament, shouldn't it? Mourning and lament at Jacob's mob and our mob. Just look at what happens when grace is not received with obedience. Look at the dysfunction of favouritism. Look at what happens when parents neglect their God-given roles and siblings overstep theirs. Look at what happens when the first cry is not to God but at children who've not been led well. Look at what happens when God's silence, and we'll come to that in a moment, look at what happens when God's silence is met by our stubborn deceit and independence. Fourth observation, the land and the locals. Uh, now, I, I don't, I don't want to push this one too far, but we, we've got we've to gotta actually pick up that Jacob and his family have moved back to hostile territory. I don't think, think things would have been more amicable at Bethel, but they're certainly not safe here. Shechem takes through lust and violence. Hamor approaches with an offer to sweep it under the carpet. Shechem might love this girl, but he still detained her at home while he goes to negotiate. The approaches to Dinah's family are open and cordial, but do you notice how they're reinterpreted when they go home for financial and material advantage? Let me say that this is no easy place to camp and settle. And I don't want to push the metaphor too far, but it's never easy to be God's people in this kind of world, especially when we hamstring ourselves with disobedience. And the offers of the world, join us, mix with us, be financially prosperous with us. We'll do whatever you want. They were made to Abraham, they were made to Isaac, and they're put in front of Jacob. And let me say, they still remain. The lure of the land, the lure of the locals, the lure of the prosperity. They're all there, aren't they? And the lure is no cleaner and it's just as damaging now. Observation five. One way of dealing uh, with the land and the locals, if you like, is to kind of watch Dinah's brothers to see how they handle it. They do start well, don't they? Verse seven, they're right to be grieved and angry. That is a proper response What has happened shouldn't have taken place. And their last words in verse 31 are true words. They have assessed the problem correctly. They're right to be upset at their father's silence and his dysfunction. But they express that anger wrongly, don't they? In excess. They deal deceitfully with the locals and the land. Do you see that there in verse 13? They deal pragmatically with the things of God, taking what he has given them and using it for their own advantage. They deal violently with their enemies in excess and a great harm to the innocent and the vulnerable. Just as Dinah's plight is horrific, can you imagine the women of that town and the kids? It's just as horrible. Here is a very stark warning about how to deal with the land and the locals and the damage that that will mete out to God's people. Uh, Let me say this up front. It is right to call sin, sin. It is right to confront it. It is right to be goodly angry at it. It is right to express horror and grief at abuse and brokenness and violence. 
It is wrong to deal with it deceitfully. It is wrong to deal with it pragmatically. It is wrong to deal with it violently. It is wrong to deal with it just as it has been given and above. None of that is how God has dealt with us, is it? In impossible grace. In generosity we don't deserve. Observation six, and we're nearly there. I don't know what you are feeling at the moment, but let me tell you that a a passage like this makes someone like me feel pretty sick in the guts. (laughs) There is an uneasy feeling about this, almost as if this is my family history to have such bleakness and brokenness in it. And do you know what's worse? As I've read this passage time and time again, initially what's worse is where's God? Do you notice that God doesn't speak in this passage? There's not one word from God in the passage. Uh, It's pretty striking. What what do you do with that? Now, I think we've got to at least say a number of things. The first is uh, the silence of God is not the absence of God. That's really important. The silence of God is not the absence of God. On a personal level, he's made a promise to Abraham's family that we've seen time and time again that he's fulfilled. On a biblical level, these are the words of God, aren't they? He is silent in the passage, but the passage is his word. The recounting of these events are God's word. So God is speaking, isn't he, by actually putting this event in his revelation. I think it's here at least to say, look how broken your world is. The sharp and stark reality of human sin and the way in which grace is disobeyed and leads to damage and humans do this to each other. And and we struggle with our dysfunction and the land and the locals that are opposed to God's family and the wrong ways we want to navigate the world. Just to read this event is to hear God's words, isn't it? Because it is God's word. And don't forget that the silence of God is not the approval or the condoning of God. The silence of God is not the approving or the condoning of God. In fact, you read a passage like this and you see that God has put this in his word, in in his family's history, and you hear the silence of God because the silence of God is quite loud and you go, surely there's something better. Surely there is something bigger. Surely there is something more gooder. Did you catch that in Psalm 56? Did you hear that? God knows the dysfunction. I've I've already hinted at it. You yourself have recorded my wanderings. God doesn't need a map. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not already in your records? Then my enemies will retreat on the day when I call. This I know, God is for me. The silence of God is not the deafness of God. He's promised to reverse the curse. He's promised to be with Jacob until everything is fulfilled. The family tree of Jesus in Matthew 1 states that truth. God's silence is not his deafness, nor is it his inactivity or apathy. In fact, did you pick up the repetition of his silence in Matthew's gospel? A moment of horror caused by sin and disobedience in the face of impossible grace. Did you hear the volume of God's silence? as the descendant of Abraham cried out on the cross to his father. Have you noticed there is no word from God at the crucifixion? Do you understand the significance of Jesus having silence from his father so that we who are sinful by nature might never again know the silence of God as we receive his impossible grace? There is something better. And it's the Son of God receiving the silence of his Father so that our sins are forgiven. 
What can we say then about Genesis 34? I'm at the last point on the outline. Remember those truths we started with? God's word reveals his character to bring life and transform his people. Uh, Let me suggest three ways we can apply it. They're there on your outline. The first is mourning. We must respond to sin with mourning. The horror of sin the manifestation of sin, the stain and the damage of sin. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 5 as Jesus says to his disciples, this is what it's like to be in my kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Please never become so hardened to the world, so easy with sin, that you lose the emotion and response of mourning. Mourn for Dinah. Mourn at foolish, grasping, violent young men. Mourn for families that are broken and parents who are silent when they should cry out to God. Mourn for siblings who are outraged but express that outrage in deceitful sin. Mourn for the things of God that we use wrongly. Mourn for families that are wrenched apart by revenge and violence. Mourn for people who are so worried about their own situation that they neglect the plight of others. Mourning. Mourning should drive us to yearning, desiring a better way. There is a better way. And the better way is when the only Son of God receives the silence of his Father. When he receives the judgment for our sins. When he's alone on a cross receiving all we deserve. As we mourn for sin, let's yearn for forgiveness. Don't rail at the silence of God wrongly but see the silence of God at the cross rightly when Jesus takes what we deserve and produces a better way. There'll be chances to chat to Dinah and her family in the world today, won't there? There'll be chances to chat with young men who grasp and take. There'll be chances to chat with families that don't know what to say and desperately want to cry out. There'll be opportunities to deal with locals and the land. There'll be moments when we're so consumed by rage and anger and revenge, we need to speak to ourselves. There'll be times of self-pity and self-interest. And in all those moments, look at the son who receives his father's silence and yearn for a better way. And finally, turning. Mourning, yearning, and turning. Turn to God. He's not deaf. He's not apathetic. His silence speaks salvation. He's got bottles with our tears in them. He is for us. He makes promises he keeps and he replaces the curse of sin with blessing. To turn to God is to hear his word. To turn to God is to pray to him. To turn to God is to receive impossible grace in Jesus obediently. To turn to God is to be a people who offer a better way in a world that thinks he is silent. Let me pray. Father, I'm exhausted, Uh, but thankfully you don't sleep, you never tire, Uh, You are always present. Thank you for those words of Psalm 121. And we can lift our eyes to the hills and know that you listen. Thank you for speaking to us today in these events. Thank you for your grace and mercy to us. And thank you that you never tire of welcoming your people into your mercy. Father, help us to mourn rightly at this world. Help us to yearn desperately for the goodness of Jesus. Help us to turn constantly to you. And in that, Father, help us to be a people who speaks to a world that thinks you are silent but needs to know the goodness of your word. Amen. Any questions?
Baxter. Yeah, Baxter's asked a really good question. Uh, he sins, we sin, we all sin. Uh, why doesn't it seem like sin has the same ramifications for us? Uh, uh, let me tell you, you've got to answer that on two levels. Okay, This is really helpful for us to think through. What does every sin do with my relationship with God? It cuts it off. <laughs> so every sin has eternal implications. One sin will remove you from the presence of God. So every sin has a massive ramification. So we never miss that vertically. And so that's why all sin is the same. <laughs> every sin is the same. Okay, Because it severs our relationship with God. Horizontally, though, different sins will have different relational impacts on people around us. Okay, And so we need to not go, oh, yeah, that's not a bad sin. I persuaded X to eat their vegetables by telling them that little lie. That's still a sin. It's a lie. Okay. We go, oh, that's not as bad as murder, pillage, uh, tax fraud. Uh, so we don't mistake the horizontal impacts of sin <laughs> with the eternal vertical impact of sin. Every sin is horrific because it says to God, I know better than you. Horizontally, they might not all have the same impact. Some will, some won't. But don't mistake the two. And don't use this horizontal, say, oh, I managed to get away with that, to go, hmm, I didn't get away with that. Does that make sense? Good question, mate. Any other questions, Phil? Uh, I heard you say silence didn't equate with God's wrath. Yep. Mm. Is that the Bible? So you also talked about silence, is that right? Yeah. So it, 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 this is the problem when you use metaphors what, <laughs> or read into metaphors. I think we've got to, when God stops speaking, we need to be listening extra carefully. Okay. Uh, God has never stopped speaking to us because we've always got this. So there is no silence from God. Don't let anyone tell you that lie. We have his true and living word. But at particular moments in his history of the world, God's silence needs to be understood correctly. So you've got the 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testaments. There's an aspect of judgment there uh, where God has said, no, I'm not sending you prophets. So when John the Baptist comes up, people go, mm, I've heard about these, but I've never met them. God is not silence in his people's exile, is he? Which proves another point. I'm still with you because people thought that God was tethered to Jerusalem. He goes, no, I'll speak to you in Babylon, Assyria. I'll speak to you in Thebes. I'll... So uh, think of it that And then there's God's silence at the cross where you kind of go, oh, what is going on there? So uh, the silence of God, I think, is just like grace. Uh, it has two sides to it, uh, uh, undeserved mercy and judgment of sin. And we need to think carefully about what the silence of God means at these moments. Does that answer your question? For those at home, Phil's nodding his head. Any other questions? Yeah, Rick. Yeah, so I think there's, there are a lot of things I've not dealt with in the passage. Uh, and I've chosen uh, one of the problems with sermons is that mine are already fulsome enough code for long, uh, that you don't want to hear everything I read. There's a lot left on the cutting room floor. So, for example, I'll raise three with you very quickly. It's very unusual for a young lady to go for a walk on her own without her brothers with her. Okay? Uh, a number of authors, I think, make a false assumption that she's culpable. I don't think we can make that. Okay? So that's one aspect there. I think the second, the, uh, an another area of silence is what do we do with Jacob and the fact that God seems to bless him immeasurably by increasing his wealth and possessions. Now, what do we do with that? And then the aspect of judgment. And I, I've chosen not to go into those because I wanted to drive through these observations. Yeah, judgment is meted out. But let's not say that that judgment is right because it was achieved deceitfully by abusing the symbols of God for self-gain. So, yeah, does that answer your question? So, yeah, I think there's an aspect of that, but, I, yeah, I chose not to go into it. Yeah, 